Consider the chicken nugget. Many of us can see its round shape in our minds and recall its salty taste. But what is its history? And what does this history have to tell us about the history of food and capitalism and about one of the most devastating industrial accidents in recent U.S. history? On today's show, we speak with Bryant Simon about the 1991 fire at a chicken processing factory in Hamlet, North Carolina. For Bryant, this tragic accident has political and economic causes. It reveals a tremendous amount about the last few decades of U.S. and global history. You are listening to Who Makes Sense, a History of Capitalism podcast. I'm Betsy Beasley. And I'm David Stein. Who Makes Sense is a monthly podcast devoted to bringing you engaging stories that explain how capitalism has changed over time. We interview historians and social and cultural critics about capitalism's past, highlighting the political and the economic changes that have created the present. Today we speak with Bryant Simon. Welcome to the show. Can you tell our listeners a bit about yourself and the book we'll be discussing today? I'm Brian Simon, and I teach history at Temple University in Philadelphia. So the book is The Hamlet Fire, a tragic story of cheap food, cheap government, and cheap lives. And it's essentially a a social autopsy of the worst industrial accident in North Carolina history, a fire that took place in the small town of Hamlet, North Carolina, at a chicken processing plant in 1991. And how do you tell this story? Where do you begin, and how does the book develop the broader analysis? The book starts with the fire itself, the Tuesday after Labor Day in 1991 at Imperial Food Products um, in Hamlet, North Carolina. A fire broke out after a hydraulic line um, had been patched together with the wrong parts. It split, splintered from its casing and spewed flammable fluid all over the place, igniting a fire in this plant that made chicken tenders. And as the workers mostly um, women, mostly single moms, mostly African-American went scurrying and running towards the doors. They found them locked. Um, Pretty quickly, the plant um, was taken over by lethal um, amounts of carbon monoxide, and 25 workers ended up dying that day at the plant. And so I I start the book with that. sad and tragic story and then peel back to try and really figure out the causes of the fire and one of the things that i was really playing with was the idea that this was an accident and pretty quickly i try and suggest that this wasn't an accident but the product of a kind of new economic arrangement that was taking shape in in america and in american capitalism a world that i argue was built around the notion of cheap that privileged lower prices over higher wages and created um, a system of labor, of eating, and of government to deliver these cheap products that fundamentally hid their costs, um, both in the kind of traditional sense of externalities, but also the threat to to workers' bodies and really to animals and to the environment and communities themselves. So it's so it's organized around this kind of notion of cheap as a way to think about a political economy that spreads over much of America beginning in the 1970s and by the 1980s is firmly implanted and, 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 and sort of ends um, on the same note by saying that despite this tragedy, this kind of logic of cheap can't and be very easily dislodged. What catalyzed the research for this book? I was um, working on my dissertation in 1991, living in North Carolina. In fact, I was driving every week from Chapel Hill to Columbia, South Carolina, which meant I drove through Hamlet. And um, I'd actually stopped in Hamlet once before the fire. I was intrigued by this place, this small town um, that was the birthplace in 1926 of both John Coltrane and of Tom Wicker and both, both were my were two of my heroes. Um, 
Coltrane, I, I, I suspect for obvious reasons, but Wicker, um, he sort of embodied the kind of ethos of what could be best about North Carolina at the time. And Tom Wicker was born in Hamlet. His father was a railroad worker, and um, he would go on to be the New York Times' is Washington bureau chief and also kind of was a really important liberal voice during the period. He And he also appeared, I knew him, from appearing on Sunday morning talk shows, had a really um, grovelly Southern accent. And so he had this role of being, you know, kind of the one of the really most famous reporters, but also he was a representation of a kind of image of the South that wasn't the most common image, the kind of butt, butt, butted up during this period against kind of George Wallace and a more reactionary kind of image of the South, or at least for me did. So I was really kind of interested in the place. And then when the fire happened, I was, I, my first book is, was about labor and politics in the South. So I was kind of all over it, but it, it was in part kind of, I, I want to sort of suggest one other thing. Part of what really got me interested in the fire was something that used to exist that doesn't anymore. And that was great newspaper coverage. The fire was covered um, deeply with like humanity, detail, and rigor by both the Charlotte Observer and the Raleigh News and Observer. And I, I was captivated by that coverage and that telling of the story. And so years later, when I was kind of thinking about a project and thinking about what I wanted to write about, and I had really begun to do more research on food, I, I kind of came back to the fire, but but in part, what allowed me to come back to it so vividly and clearly was this great newspaper coverage that had happened in 1991 and 1992. And in some ways, that liberated me to write a different kind of book. If, if the press coverage hadn't been so great, I, I might have found myself writing a narrative that described the events. But because it was so good, I felt like I could sort of understand what happened really quickly and then go back and really try and understand the causes in a deeper way. And then I didn't realize this until actually I started writing the book that um, not long after the fire, I moved to Los Angeles to take a job, a postdoc at Caltech. And the LA Times ran a front page story about the New South. And you can imagine what this was. It was 1992, 1993, and it was sort of a tribute to the big glass towers that um, lurked over Charlotte, Nashville, and Atlanta. And I wrote this letter to the editor that was published to the, to the um, LA Times reminding them of Hamlet, suggesting that this was really also part of the New South. So I guess I had been thinking about it since it happened. And when I was looking for another project, it made sense to, to write about this. You just mentioned this idea of Hamlet as part of the so-called New South. Can you explain that important point for our listeners? Well, it, in many ways, right, the New South ha has always been about kind of industrial progress in the South and is focused on the what you'd imagine kind of economic progress in urban areas of the South. But the South would have never become new yet again and grown yet again with a kind of mass industrialization of the countryside. And that's really um, one of the stories I tell in the book, and I think one that probably deserves more attention is that that the South became in many ways the industrial kind of center of the United States in the 70s and 80s, and, and not because of plants outside of Atlanta, but because of relatively smaller scale, less capital intensive investment in the formal rural areas and small towns. And I and I and I really think that's an important part of both the story of, of American capitalism and industrialization, and one that I, I don't think is, has been written nearly enough at this point. Quoting Claudia Rankine, you write that the fire was, quote, wrongfully ordinary. I think this is something that gets to the heart of your arguments. Can you explain for us what you mean by that? I, I, mean, I was so happy when I found that quote. Um, but what I meant by wrongfully ordinary is that what happened in Hamlet, um, well, the events were spectacular and, and, and literally in the sense of the fire itself. What happened there every day was what was happening across the United States in the 70s and 80s as 
more and more workers were be were being made vulnerable, and I, I I mean that really specifically. They were being made vulnerable by a whole series of political decisions about um, how to run the economy, what the state's role would be in plants, and who was going to be valued and who wasn't going to be valued. And and so, what happened in Hamlet was the product of this series of decisions and what it meant to work and live under the conditions that these decisions guaranteed. Because, you know, if the fire didn't happen, almost everything else would have happened, right? I mean, the, the workers in that plant's lives would have been systematically devalued. If they weren't um, jeopardized by that. And again, even the decisions to, to fix the, the, the broken part, broken machines with the wrong parts, to not turn off the burners under the fryer, which was a kind of basic safety um, element, to lock the doors, were all parts of the logic of the system. And they were all ordinary. They were things that were happening every day in Hamlet and in hundreds of thousands of out-of-the-way plants across the country that, that were adding to the nation's wealth, but also jeopardizing workers. So... That takes us to the site of chicken production, a notoriously dangerous workplace. Can you explain to our listeners the role of chicken production in Hamlet specifically, but also more broadly? Yeah, I mean, Hamlet is part of the food chain of chicken um, during the 70s and 80s. And, you know, the the first thing that's really kind of was fascinating to me is that the fire happens right at a kind of really important moment in American eating. And that is the moment that chicken takes over from beef as the number one source of meat-based protein in the United States. And this is, you know, really historically a kind of amazing kind of moment. And, um, and largely that had taken, that takes place, I would argue, because chicken had gotten cheaper. Um, there was some talk about chicken being healthier. We'll talk about that in a second. But it was really that chicken had been made cheaper. And the making of chicken, the making of cheaper chickens is something that sort of involved a whole kind of chain of events um, from genetic engineering, um, really to the industrialization of chickens themselves, to the kind of speeding up of the disassembly line. And all of this at each step along the way, um, the process of making chicken got cheaper, but also the meat and what it did to people got more dangerous. And um, eventually what was processed in Hamlet were already cut up um, and frozen chicken breasts. And so that also meant that the chicken that arrived there had gone through a series of kind of, had been in a series of places. Each of those places was involved in this kind of you know, race to the bottom and, and cheapness. And, and that meant um, making growers of chicken more vulnerable and more economically pressed. That meant um, the slaughterhouses themselves, which it was, is really what we think about, where the assembly plants um, had gotten more dangerous and, and faster and also um, were more of a biological kind of nightmare as they kind of um, produced all kinds of foodborne illnesses themselves signed off by the government. I mean, the government basically says, look, you can run these plants as fast as you want. We're not really going to inspect things. And if that means dredging, you know, chickens through bats of fecal soup, that's fine. You know, just so long as you remain profitable, essentially. And so by the time it, it got to Hamlet again, what they're processing was already cut up chicken breasts. The plant in Hamlet, so it wasn't a disassembly plant, it, the dangers there lurked in one, the temperature. Um, it was either really hot or really cold. Most of the workers would suffer from carpal tunnel syndrome and other repetitive motion um, injuries. And, and also, um, they suffered from a kind of relentlessness. Um, it, as, as I talk about in the book, um, one of the ways this relentlessness pay, played out was Workers needed to be on the line, um, and if they wanted to go to the bathroom or needed to go to the bathroom when it wasn't a break or their lunch break, they had to ask um, the foreman or a superintendent. And they were often told no. They would um, be ridiculed if they needed to go. 
I think there becomes this dividing line in work about whether one can determine when she or he um, has access to a bathroom and can use it at their own liberty. And I think increasingly we've created jobs where that's not the case. And certainly that wasn't the case in, in Hamlet. So it, it was a, a regime built upon speed, built upon relentlessness, and built also, like everything else in this story, political leaders and regulatory agencies turning a blind eye to what was going on. You mentioned this idea of multiple forms of cheapness. Can you describe that a little bit more? How are these ideas interlocking and where are they stemming from? Yeah, so I mean, the first is cheap food, right? I mean, it, it's, it's kind of fascinating. Much of the food that Americans eat gets cheaper through the 1960s and 70s. Chicken again being like a kind of amazing example. The actual cost of chicken in 1980 is the same as it was in 1923. That's how how much cheaper it had become, it, you know. And, and as you know, we've at, by that point had gone through several periods of inflation. But again, that that cheapness was the product of kind of a relentless series of efficiencies that depended on speeding up labor and really the brutalization of animals. And in the case of chicken. It also depends on the delivery of cheap calories. And this is, for me, an important part of the argument. Um, as the system of cheap drives down workers' wages, it offers them, in exchange for that, cheap goods to buy. And, and much of that is cheap food. But, but on the other side of that kind of cheap is that the food itself is incredibly dangerous, laden with fat, sugar, and salt, and potentially addictive. But... This is subsidized, it's, it's industrialized, and it's what people can produce relatively easily with their hands aching and their backs aching after they work. But again, this produces, I think, you know, much of what you can see in the, in the, the problematic, but in the rise of BMI rates, um, obesity in America in the 1970s and 1980s, I think is directly tied to the drop in wages and people's reliance on cheap food. The second kind of stream of cheap that I talk about is cheap government. Part of the idea of cheap was increasingly that the the most efficient way for an economy to grow was essentially for the government to facilitate business. And that had been a long Southern tradition. And in many ways, I think the South kind of pioneers in some ways the kind of government ideas about cheap and about kind of making um, – the places in the in the South um, business friendly, which which is the word they use, but this relied essentially on on two things, and I think that both of these are important. One is deregulation itself, but the second, and I think again something people haven't paid enough attention to, is not actually enforcing the laws that are on the books. And in the case of Hamlet, um, there are laws on the books that would have protected workers, but they're not in. They're not enforced. For instance, the local fire department um, will never inspect this plant, despite the fact that it had three fires in it, was supposed to inspect every facility in, in the town, but it just claimed it didn't have enough money, so it didn't do it. I mean, there are endless cases of this kind of not enforcing the rules in the books. And again, there is this kind of systematic deregulation, but I'll, I'll give you another example of kind of the combination of them, and that's OSHA. OSHA, which had been passed in 1970 and was supposed to protect workers and um, ensure workplace safety. And this depended largely on inspections, um, the threat of inspection of plants. Imperial Foods, which is the factory that burns, had originally been located in Moosick, Pennsylvania, and it had faced um, several OSHA investigations there. It will move to North Carolina in part um, because of the deregulatory climate there, but its OSHA violations will not travel with it. And then in North Carolina, it, it finds itself located in a state that by 1991, um, this is, a, I think, an amazing statistic, is the most industrial state in the union. It has 180,000 workplaces, and it has somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 to 40 industrial inspectors. So if they did their job, in other words, if they went and inspected one plant a day, every day, 
it would have taken them almost 70 years to inspect every factory in North Carolina. So that meant that, that OSHA effectively didn't exist. And, and what that means further on the kind of notion of cheap government is that for the Rose, the family that owned the Imperial plant, that if they abided by workplace safety regulations, they would put themselves at a competitive disadvantage. And there was no reason to do that because they were never going to be inspected. And so this was a way in which cheap government essentially both deregulated and made sure that the laws and the books didn't apply. And this leads to the third thing, cheap lives. Essentially, the story I tell, and in some ways I was influenced here, and I wrote the book in the backdrop of Black Lives Matter, um, was that some people's lives seem to matter more than others in the United States. And I, I think it's probably not an accident that, you know, we have a kind of working class that no longer gets government protections as that working class becomes increasingly made up of women and people of color. And again and again, the city of Hamlet, the state of North Carolina, the United States said to the people who worked in that factory, their lives didn't matter, that they weren't worthy of protection, that in the wake of the fire, their lives weren't very much in actuarial terms. And perhaps most kind of strikingly to me, is that after the fire, um, the city of Hamlet refused to tear down the plant that existed. Um, it was basically the charred remains of the plant existed in the essentially black part of Hamlet where many people who either survived the fire or had family and relatives who survived the fire. And they had to drive by that plant every day and it acted as a form of terror. Yet it wasn't worth $50,000 to the community to take, to take that down. And, and this then, this kind of sense from the community itself that their lives didn't matter shaped the way they saw themselves in the community, their faith in political leaders, and their real, really their ability to cope with the kind of um, pressing demands and, and terrors that are associated with post-traumatic stress disorder, which many of them had to deal with in the wake of the fire. So can you tell our listeners about the research process? especially since you spoke with survivors and did oral histories with them about this traumatic event? Yeah, it was an interesting thing to do. I, I, I reached out to people who survived the fire and, um, you know, sometimes I had never had a situation like this. I would go to Hamlet and I maybe had arranged, I maybe would have arranged five or six interviews to do and two would happen. Literally one time, um, the only everyday a week restaurant that's open in Hamlet um, is a Hardee's. And I was waiting in the Hardee's to meet someone and I watched them drive up and drive away. Um, so that all of this is to say that, yeah, I talked to people, but it was all often painful and hard. And I appreciated them kind of revisiting those stories to help me write the book. And the stories were full of what you might imagine. They were full of pain. They were full of regret. They were full of loss for their friends. And sometimes even guilt, you know, I mean, people would talk about how, and, and this, this startled me. Um, they internalize sometimes the blame for the fire. Um, people would say to me, they felt bad that they had never reached out to authorities, even though they knew the authorities weren't going to help them. They felt stigmatized by the accusation that they stole chicken. And they felt that nobody was really going to listen. I mean, I think at, at this point, you know, the fire had been 25 or 26 years on. Most of them were still battling with the fire itself. The memorials in town had stopped. And they felt as if really kind of they had just, you know, that the, the, their stories had been passed over and didn't matter anymore. I, I would also say in terms of or of of trying to talk to people, I had the most success talking to people who had already talked, um, who had talked after the fire. It was harder to get new people to be willing to talk. It was a little harder. I mean, I, I couldn't get any of the, so the, the majority of the workforce in the plant was African-American, um, 
almost entirely women worked on the line. I had a hard time getting, and I, I, I only later was able to talk to me to of the white supervisors, maintenance crew, otherwise non-line people who work there. An interesting group of people who I got to talk to were a number of first responders. They were helpful in what was going on the day of the fire, but they were they um, were really good at the kind of larger background of the community. The other kind of interesting source problem, and, and I actually think this is something for historians to think about, is that um, I had trouble getting the records from the state of North Carolina. And at one point, um, I knew that the, the Department of Labor in North Carolina had investigated very quickly after the fire, and they had interviewed virtually everyone who had survived. They'd interviewed a lot of the, um, and that included the kind of largely white maintenance personnel. They had interviewed a number of the um, USDA inspectors who had gone into the plant. And I could not get them to give me those records until, again, I hired a lawyer who wrote um, a kind of, you know, a letter who understood the law that got them to give them to me. And, and the reason why is it's the system of cheap that essentially the archive system in a place like North Carolina has been eviscerated by budget cuts. And it's not that they didn't want me to see the records. I don't think they cared one way or the other. They didn't have the staff to actually process them. And so one of the interesting things I confronted was it was much harder to get 20, 20th, late 20th century records than mid-century or late 19th century in North Carolina, in part because of these budget cuts. And you wouldn't have thought that. You thought I'd be overwhelmed by kind of government materials. But actually, I was sort of underwhelmed by it and met resistance at almost every turn. That's really remarkable and has tremendous repercussions for future historians. Yeah, no, I, I actually think it's something that it, historians, I mean, particularly historians of recent history, need to really begin to think about um, but it's clearly the case in North Carolina. The records in recent years are not as good as they are for, say, the 1940s. And one other really strange thing, and I don't know what this is about, the governor's records, it was, it was a Republican governor, not that this particularly matters in the state of North Carolina. This is actually one of the points I make in the book, that, that there's a kind of central agreement on economic growth in North Carolina there were big, thick files of, you know, wealthy Eastern North Carolina people complaining about their kids not getting into medical school. There was not a single file dedicated just to materials on the Hamlet fire. And I don't know where they went, if they didn't come. I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm, this is not a conspiracy. I, I just, they just weren't there. And I don't know what that's about. Nobody can answer this question. And frankly, the archivists weren't particularly interested either. I think if I would have been talking about like a small community during the 19th century, they might have been more interesting, more interested in what I had to say. But it, it, I have not figured out what that's about. So there are clear resonances between this fire and the Triangle Shirtwaist fire. With that in mind, can you explain why the doors were locked and what that has to do with this particular moment of regulation? I don't think that the Emmett and Brad Rowe wanted to lock their workers into, into the plant. What's interesting is, and, and this is a pretty complicated question, um, in the wake of the fire, virtually everyone reported that the doors were locked because the workers were stealing chickens. 25 years later, 26 years later, talking to people in North Carolina, if you asked them why the doors were locked, people who know about the fire, they'll say, well, you know, workers were stealing chickens. Actually, that's not true. And this is an important part of the story. The doors were locked because the backside of the plant was near a trash bin, a, a trash compactor, and flies were getting in the plant and they were landing on the chicken. Now, well, this plant was never inspected by OSHA and most plants in North Carolina wouldn't be inspected by OSHA. It was inspected almost every day by the USDA. So this tells us one important story, and this is a story that I think, you know, we, we need to complicate the kind of neoliberal paradigm of just the kind of anti-statism and withering of government. 
It's actually a reallocation and repositioning of government. We're willing to spend money, um, as we know, on prisons. We're willing to spend money on roads in a place like North Carolina. And there was at least some willingness to spend money on consumer protections, though we're not willing to spend money, it seems, on workers' rights and safety. So what happens is these flies are coming in the plant. The USDA is dogging the owners, saying, look, you got to do something about these flies. And eventually the owners and one of the maintenance men says, oh, I have an idea. Why don't we lock the doors? Because that way n- nobody can go out those back doors for a smoke. And, and then, you know, no flies will come in. And the USDA and, you know, these documents here are just kind of amazing. The USDA, so this is the federal government says, hey, that's a great idea. They don't say it's a great idea. They said, fine, that seems like a, a reasonable solution to the problem. So in June of 1991, three months before the fire, the doors are locked. Now, that story gets reported after the fire, but it quickly fades away. And again, the story that's told is the doors are locked because workers are stealing chickens. And that then becomes a justification for the locking of the doors, particularly among a kind of certain segment of white officialdom in North Carolina who say, well, you know, if they hadn't locked the door, if they hadn't stolen chickens, the doors wouldn't be locked. So, you know, well, it's unfortunate this is justified. And this becomes one of the justifications for not giving eminent row um, in the wake of the fire a stiffer sentence. So that is an important part, both of the kind of how we value government and how we devalue some people, like their lives aren't worth protecting, but the food that other people are going to eat at Shoney's is, is worth protecting. The question about the relationship between Hamlet and the Triangle Factory is a complicated one, but part of it has to do with the triumph of deregulation, um, the forgetting of the past in the 1970s and 1980s, the sense that you know some parts of the country, it's all right to send them back to the Gilded Age. And I think that that becomes a kind of way of organizing economic thinking in the United States during this period. And, and the other comparison to, to Triangle, which I think is an important one, is that despite the, um, the tragedy of the fire in Hamlet, despite the loss of lives, despite the kind of, you know, if, if those doors were open, most of the people would have survived the fire. One or two of the people who were closest to the blaze, maybe not, but um, everybody else would have survived the fires if, there were, if the doors were open and they could, they could have gotten out. So in, in the wake of, of the Hamlet fire, there is a, a good deal of hand-wringing in North Carolina, a good deal of finger-pointing, a good deal of noise about change. And in fact, in 1992, the year after the fire, the General Assembly comes back to Raleigh and does pass a kind of range of reforms. But it doesn't have the transformative moment that the Triangle does. It doesn't breed and generate a whole new way of thinking about government. It doesn't create um, a cadre of reformers like Francis Perkins and Al Smith and um, other members of Robert Wagner, other members who will come to play a prominent role in the New Deal. What happens is the reforms are put in place. Some modest changes are made, particularly for around fire inspections. And things go back to normal in North Carolina. There's not a kind of deep ideological shift. Um, And by going back to normal, that means creating an economy that is um, functions for business, a faith that business will create jobs, and that is the way we generate economic health. And the selling of the state is a bastion of cheap labor. And essentially replacing African-American workers with um, both documented and undocumented workers from around the world in um, the food processing plants and other cheap labor across the state. And and essentially, you know, what I would argue is, is that this is a tragedy that, um, you know, that that doesn't produce fundamental shifts. And we should, we should, you know, really think about that. And secondly, I, I would argue that, that, the fact that it doesn't produce fundamental change speaks to the real power of cheap, that this is an ideology that actually quickly kind of took over and dug in deeply and is difficult to eradicate. And I think um, it's embodied um, 
in a phrase that Walmart uses in, a, in an advertisement that maybe should go on our flag, and it says, save money, live better. And I think in some ways that's become the national motto, and it's hard to argue with it. And, and few politicians, there's not many on, on the stage right now who really are kind of attacking this idea. I would say the exception is in the, you know, some of the kind of alt labor movement that is really thinking about the $15 an hour, some of the other kind of attacks on the kind of austerity moves, but, but they haven't even been embraced by, I would say, the kind of mainstream of the Democratic Party or the mainstream of the labor movement. One question I have is how Hamlet fits into our larger story about globalization. Yeah, I, I actually think that Hamlet is globalization, even though everything that's produced at that plant is produced, you know, within 200 miles and then distributed within 200 miles. But, but Hamlet, to me, is what we mean by globalization. And what, that, and what I mean by that is that here's a place where working people are systematically made vulnerable. And they're made vulnerable by capital that is totally fluid. And that's exactly what happens in Hamlet, right? That the economy changes there. Uh, an employer realizes that he has a monopoly over a kind of pool of labor. And, and that monopoly is created, you know, socially and culturally, but politically, right? And he can move or she or it, you know, in the case of a corporation can move there and have this monopoly over this vulnerable labor force. And that is what gets repeated again and again in the kind of, you know, what we call globalization. And so to me, Hamlet is in the stream of what, you know, the kind of globalization that we see taking shape after World War II, really taking over in the 70s and 80s, and then in some ways being exported around the world. And, and, and a few other people have really suggested this, but again, it's something I'd love to read more about is that I, I actually think that the South is beginning, you know, sort of because of its sort of competitive disadvantages, because of some of the kind of ways in which the state, and I both mean this like state government and the state as a kind of entity operate, anticipate what we think of as globalization. And, and so that it, it, it shouldn't be surprising then that as one labor stream moves forward, and as some people have documented, African-American women um, are more likely to organize in the 1990s and begin to organize in the 1990s. And what happens? As we see across the global order, as workers raise their voices, they get replaced by a new vulnerable workforce. Who's more vulnerable than undocumented, relatively vulnerable workers from the global South who come to the American South to work. And now, I mean, it, it's to the point where it's all workers in the South who kind of share this similar vulnerability. Um, and I think, you know, some of the most persuasive passages in um, Packers Unwinding are set in the South with workers of color, but also white workers who find themselves in these out-of-the-way places that for a variety of reasons they can't leave. Places like Hamlet have been, you know, pretty devastated. And, you know, any work is good work. And, and people in Hamlet were we're clear about that. In the wake of the fire, people were traumatized. But some people immediately were asking, well, when's the plant going to reopen? Because they couldn't imagine their way forward without that plan for all. Of, I mean, it's not like they suffered from false consciousness. They knew it sucked. But they also knew the economic reality of their lives and a job in a place where jobs were few and far between was the only way they could imagine piecing their lives back together. The economist Joan Robinson said that the misery of being exploited by capitalists is nothing compared to the misery of not being exploited at all. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I had not heard that line. And like, you know, it's always crappy. After you've written a book, you get like the better stuff, right? But, but I think you're exactly right. And, and that's exactly how workers imagine their jobs and why they themselves were silent. I, I was really playing around, and I think you probably recognize this without sort of calling attention to it, with kind of debates about agency here and the way in which, again, what we call globalization is about systematically limiting 
the tools, the agency of working people. And monopoly is important here. And the key monopoly is the monopoly to, to give or take away a job. And this just, this, this shapes the way people approach Imperial to the day of the fire itself, right? Um, and I try and tell this story. It's not like they like the job, they like their employers, they like their kind of silence. They had no other way to imagine um, providing for their families. One important part of this story that connects it with so many of our lives is the chicken nugget. Can you tell us about that history? Sure. I, I mean, the chicken nugget, I think, is a great story. Um, and, and it's one I tell in the book. And essentially what happened is chicken got cheaper through the 70s and 80s. And more and more Americans who watched their wages decline found themselves grabbing packets of chicken in the store. But they were often disappointed in the taste of chicken. Um, and so at the very moment of chicken's triumph in 1990, when it surpasses beef as the um, most eaten meat-based protein, eaters suffer from what one um, food person calls chicken fatigue. They wanted like more intense taste. And so food people begin almost immediately to think about ways, one, to use scraps from chicken to make it more profitable, and secondly, to enhance its flavor. And by flavor, they mean uh, a kind of mouthful, kind of blasts of fat. And so they figure out ways to fry it up. And when the chicken nuggets first really introduced, the McNuggets first really introduced by McDonald's, it's a huge hit. And it's a huge hit because one of it, the crunch, the relative cheapness of it, and the dipping sauces. Those dipping sauces give it a kind of variability. So what happens is, you know, McDonald's introduces this product and everybody wants in, right? And as everybody wants in, the price of chicken nuggets drops, but it also makes it hard for like small companies to participate. So again, back to the chicken nugget, what happens is, is that this becomes the way that most people, you know, begin to eat chicken. And by 1990, Half of all chicken sold in the United States is fried. And as the chicken nugget takes over, there are people who think, well, you know, maybe this isn't so healthy or maybe I want a bigger piece of it. And you have the chicken tender business. And so Imperial gets involved. It can't actually get involved in the chicken nugget business. It's too competitive. It gets involved in the chicken tender business. And so you have this really kind of interesting phenomenon happening Chicken initially is embraced in part because it's healthier, but eaters don't necessarily like the fact that its taste is kind of bland, and part of its blandness is a product of its industrial production. The kind of force feeding of chicken with corn leads to a kind of flat taste in the, in the product, and so to enhance the taste of chicken, people begin to you know, basically carve it up, put it with binder, and fry it. And then people in general like it better, but also that chicken has a couple other functions that sort of work with the world of cheap. One is it has a near addictive quality. So families begin to give it to their kids because it, you know, it's something that they like, and then they're afraid not to give it to them because if you don't have money, you don't want to give your kids something that they possibly won't eat. The second thing is this happens right about the time that the microwave begins to take over. Well, People I interview, the women who worked in the plant, would often talk about how bad their hands hurt. And so the chicken nugget or the chicken tender was an easily microwavable item that didn't require any preparation. Um, they were tired, worn out, had to deal with all the other things often at their homes. Here was an easy meal to make. And so they find themselves in this cycle where they're dependent on a food that's relatively cheap but it's dangerous. It's dangerous in terms of calories. It's dangerous in terms of its fat and salt content. And it's dangerous in terms of addiction. Um, some food scientists will talk about the way in which heavily fried and fat food elicits a kind of similar reaction to cocaine. And that you once you have it, you want more of it. And you need to keep eating it. And so then the, you know, the the kind of repercussions of this are, are, I think, in what we see now in the paradox of plenty, that 
as people have less money to spend on food, they rely increasingly on industrialized food products that themselves um, are one of the reasons and part of the cause of, of obesity. And so then they are blamed actually for the, the other side is they're blamed for making the wrong food choices and sort of, oh, we don't need to do anything for them. Where again, I think if you do a map of obesity rates in the United States, they, they graft on perfectly with the decline of wages. This is so important because the way we told this story until recently really blamed consumers for all of this. And I think your story provides us with a much more apt one about how constraints were placed on consumers' choices. Well, I'd go one step further, and I think this is like an important thing argument to make is that working people are being utterly rational in their food choices. And that is, if you are systematically driving down people's wages, why wouldn't they go to the most calorie-dense foods for the lowest cost? And, and that's what they do. I mean, they, you know, and, and I, you know, quote this story from Place at the Table and other sources, you know, a dollar's worth of chicken tenders at the time has about 350 cal. I can't remember the exact number. You know, and a dollar's worth of broccoli has about 18 calories or something. Plus, you have to make it. I, I don't think that eating shaming has stopped, right? And I don't think that um, in the larger culture, people aren't blamed for making the wrong decisions about what to eat. And, and you know, the other byproduct of this is artificially makes other foods look more expensive. If you, if you subsidize corn-based products, and then everything with corn is then subsidized, and so chicken would fit with that, then that then strawberries or, or you know, broccoli is artificially at a higher price. Very few people link this to the kind of crisis of wages for working people. And, I, and to me, that's a really important dynamic to both the story I'm trying to tell and to how we understand food, class, and eating in America in, in the last 40 years. So what would you like your readers and our listeners to take away from this story? Sure. I mean, I think of the book as an important act of remembering, right, of bringing this story back up, um, because much of what it is about is now. And that the focus is not going to be easy, but that, that cheap and the wholesale externalities it relies on and the kind of fraud of price are all dimensions of the world we live in today. And they're all, um, I think that hopefully what the book can do is be part of the broader campaign against austerity regimes, which, you know, I mean, that's where the real danger lies. And, and to once again, to imagine a political economy that is about aggregate demand, that's about fairness, that's about um, the need for working people to have a voice in their daily lives. Without that, we um, those are the only paths as I see them to some more just order. If you liked our show, make sure to check us out at whomakesensepodcast.com. Like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash whomakesense, and follow us on Twitter at whomakesense. And let us know if there are topics that you want to know more about. You can also learn more about Brian's book at our website, whomakesensepodcast.com. We would also love if you could rate and review us on iTunes. That helps us find more listeners who can enjoy the show. Join us next month for more Histories of Capitalism.